Welcome to Something to Talk About from the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center. We're sponsored by Fieldstone Communities of Bainbridge Island, which offers uh, compassionate and innovative care up Rolling Bay. They have day stay and respite programs. And if you want to learn more, jot down this number, 3068931. I also want to make sure to acknowledge that the Senior Community Center is on the ancestral homeland of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Suquamish tribe. We honor them and we are very grateful for their hospitality and we are overwhelmed by their care for these lands and waters since time immemorial. Today we're going to talk about Kitsap history, U.S. history, Black history. And uh, to get us going, uh, Anne Lovejoy is going to introduce Akuye Karen Vargas. Thank you, Reed. And thank you so much, Akuye, for joining us. Um, coming straight from teaching a Black History Month class in Bremerton, right? Yes, I'm at the Catalyst School here with the Young Scholars this morning. And, and we have been doing some historical things here in Kitsap County, especially here at the Catalyst school where they are very inclusive and they're bringing in all of the cultures. Great. Yeah, I love that. One of the things you and I've talked about recently, like this morning, is that you almost have to excavate some of the local history, like, an, like a historical archaeologist digging out hidden history from past records and archives. And you've done a lot of that kind of work, haven't you? quite a bit here in Kitsap County. Um, but Diane Robertson was the one that kind of really was a pioneer of all of the footprints of, of African-Americans here in Kitsap County, uh, all the way back to the 1700s. So she laid a sure foundation for the, uh, the Kitsap County Black Historical Society to be able to preserve a lot of the footprints of America here in Kitsap County. Well, and one thing I've noticed in the newspapers even lately is there's a movement to rename some historical sites that were called by racial slurs and are now going to be honored with the actual names of early pioneers. Is that is that right? Yes. Yes, it's in it's in motion for sure. Uh, it has to go through some national um, processes, but yes, it's it looks very uh, promising that those names will be changed historically uh, and on the national registrar uh, for change. So it it has been passed by the state of Washington. Now it has to go through the national process, but it it looks all good. So we'll have the. Um, Rodney White Slew and the um, Nathaniel Sargent, is it a pond? I forget. Lake. What, lake. Yeah. Thank you. And yes. I think that's pretty yeah. great because it sort of shows that public policy can be can be influenced, that we can still change, that things can happen, you know, now, today, that, you know, maybe obviously couldn't have happened 100 years ago, but that, you know, we have a way to help change history, right? We can make things happen. You know, one of the things you and I spoke about earlier as well, and was about um, being able to do this um, work of healing and, and reconciling our history and making sure that we know that during those different time periods in our history, um, things um, weren't very healthy for our nation, but to be able to go back and reconcile and heal and be able to correct and unearth some of the history that has been erased and buried and just not included in our nation's history is very important as we move forward. Yeah, like I was thinking about how, was it just last year that we were all at the Bremerton Post Office and it was getting renamed to honor um, Mr. Turpin and, and you yes. were telling me, yes, but he still hasn't received his Congressional Honor Medal of Honor. It's like, it just takes so no, long. He has it. And, and it does. And, you know, um, there is a process to everything, especially you're looking at 
uh, national laws and policies and procedures. They have to go through that legislative process and, you know, has to be voted on by our Congress and all of these things. So it does take, a, it takes a process to be able to get things done and names changed and, and history corrected. But, you know, this is a wonderful time in our nation's history that we can be able to do this healing and corrective work um, that needs to happen here, especially for those that were enslaved to these Americas and then the atrocities that happened with our indigenous and tribal and native communities that the land that we are on now and so we do have to heal that history and we do have to heal the land um that in which we stand on i think one of the pieces we were going to talk about today is like how do you observe black history month and one of the things i really um enjoyed from one of the books i've been reading to my grandkids this is one called 28 days um, and the yes. author says right in the beginning, I've always had a love-hate relationship with Black History Month. I love that Black culture is shared and studied for a whole month, but as a student of color, I hated the idea of ignoring it the other 11 months. On top of that, I kept learning the same things about the same people, and after a while, no matter how proud I was of my culture, I got bored and just stopped listening. As an author, I wanted to change that. I wanted to bring Black History Month alive. And I think about how you do that yeah. because it isn't just a month and a, what you always say, a one and a done, one and it's done. It's not about that, is it? Um, no. But I also like the approach this guy took that for 28 days of February, we could all kind of do the pledge and say, well, okay, today I'm going to look up somebody I don't really know much about. Um, instead of the same wonderful people who did amazing things, there's a lot more history than the top 10, right? Of course, it's always there. And, and like we spoke about earlier, it's about unearthing uh, this history that has not been shared in the history that has been erased. Like here in Kitsap County, you know, our historical first, they should be acknowledged because some of them were Navy heroes, the first justice of the peace in Seabag back in 1863. Now you think about that, this was before slavery, had ended in this nation. We had a black justice of the peace for Kitsap County. And I do believe that he was the first for the state of Washington, but I have to make sure that I researched that out thoroughly to be able to say Nathaniel Sargent, Nathaniel Sargent was the first African-American justice of the peace for Washington state who lived right here in our county. But like I said, you have to be able to dig that out and ensure that that was actual history. So it's important that as we move forward, we want to be accurate with our history because that's important. Sometimes it's not just that it's been erased, but it's not being preserved in an accurate way to be able to make sure that it is documented properly. And so that's one of the things that we're doing with the, the, the historical markers here in Kitsap County, the footprints of African-Americans that have made contributions and tremendous contributions for civic, as well as religious, as well as governmental, you know, the military footprints here in our county, even in um, our school districts. You know, a lot of people don't know about the the work that African Americans contributed to our educational system here in Kitsap County. Can you say a little more about that? Well, one of the things that that we know. We know that one of our pioneering uh, educators back in the 1800 was uh, one of the Garrison daughters. And so, and Jane Ruley, I don't think a lot of people know about Jane Ruley, had her own school in Kitsap County, teaching African-American students back in the day. And that story is not, you know, documented well or being preserved or even being shared in our archives, in our state archives. So we have to do that type of work, you know, 
Uh, a lot of our, our pioneers here were black loggers that worked as mill workers to be able to clear this land. Uh, you know, um, when we talk about the Rodney Whites that cut all the roads, when we talk about the garrisons that, that cleared the land and then sold it to even Bremerton, and their stories are not being preserved as well. So you, we, we want to be able to make sure that those pioneers and their labor and their contributions are not being erased or even lost. Well, and it's interesting because now we're going to have the Nathaniel Sargent Lake, but are we going to have the Nathaniel Sargent story? It's like we need to have both those pieces to make it really count, right? Of course. Otherwise, you know, again, we'll only have a piece of the story and not being able to be able to celebrate. Because one one of the things that we're talking about, how do we how do we begin to have our communities celebrate local history? Like the footprint of the Japanese that were interned here on our beloved island, you know, on Bainbridge, that that story is in the schools being taught, being preserved, so that it's not being erased or lost. And so one of the things that I always want to do is ensure that that our young people coming up know that it took all of us within our communities and we've all made contributions. And what are, you know, we don't have to look, you know, across our nation. We can begin to preserve the footprints of those that have made contributions right here in our own local communities. Well, and it's not all in the past, is it? I mean, there's the history of today is just as powerful as the history of yesterday. And I, I know you and I've talked about the many people yeah. who are making history right now in Kitsap County, right? Yeah, of course. Of course, there, there are many of those that, that have been doing the work of social justice, race equity across our county, uh, the Kitsap E-Race Coalition, Kitsap Surge, you know, the uh, Colored Women's Association, which a lot of people don't know that that was back in the 40s. It's being taught in schools. If you Google uh, the Legacy Project, the Lillian Walker, right here from Bremerton, it is being, it has already been documented and archived at the state level with John Hughes. He was able to get her story before she passed uh, at the age, uh, I think she was 98, but don't quote me, but oh. she was well up in, she was almost a hundred years old. And we have been able to document Dr. Maxine Mims, who is still with us, who is 95 years old, of her contributions, which if you read from the, the uh, Secretary of State, it's documented very well there um, with the Dr. Maxine Mims and, and uh, many of those that made contributions at the state level. And it's 1968, the year that rocked Washington. And you'll be able to pull all of those historical footprints of those African-Americans that made state contributions across the state of Washington. And so, and we have many of their footprints right here came out of Kitsap County. And Reed just put the link to that um, in the chat if anybody wants to take it and copy it out of that. So you can Wonderful. look at it more closely later. Yes. And, and understand that, you know, Lillian Walker, all, all, you know, when you talk about the Bremerton Carver Civic Club, a lot of people don't know about all the work they did at a national level. Can you say a little bit about that? Uh-huh. The Bremerton Carver Civic Center, I think they started way back in the 40s, and they were part of the Washington Association of Colored Women. They are the ones that even started the YWCA here for the state of Washington. And so they laid the foundation for that work, and the founding members was uh, Lillian Walker and Miss Marie Greer, right from Bremerton. And, and I know that on the um, the YWCA website, there's a list of distinguished women of Kitsap. Um, 
and many, many of them are women of color. So that's a great place to do a little bit of yeah. um, History Month oh, research yeah. if you want to. There's great stories on that website. And you're on there too, I believe. Okay. Oh, am I now? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, when you think about Julia Jacobs who had footprints even with our, 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 our you know, our Suquamish tribe, you know, and daughter of Chief Jacobs, you know, those stories and those footprints and how she preserved a lot of the traditional practices for the Suquamish tribe, African-American woman, daughter of Chief Jacob. Now that's an interesting- and Don't forget story. about the Bremerton All-Stars you know, we had the Bremerton All-Stars. Don't know if you knew about them and they had their own African-American baseball team right out of Kitsap County. Oh, that's awesome. Reed keeps pu putting cool yes. um, cool links on the web, on the chat. So take a peek. And Jana, you had something yes. on here too. Jana, you, do you wanna say something about that quote you put in? Oh, I just got that from the link uh, Reed posted. I also see that Rita has her hand up. Oh, well, thanks, Rita. Oh, I was going to say it's interesting because next month is Women's History Month. Ha! Huh. Oh, yeah. So we have an opportunity to really take a look at Black women, women of color as well as just all women. I think that's pretty interesting. So very well, much so do something about that yes and, you know, I and think we about those always... calendars do you ever get those calendars and every day there's a thought for the day and I think you know having a calendar like that with a woman every day with an amazing you know a little bio and here's to look up more wouldn't that be the most wonderful gift capturing some of your stories you... Karen no this is wonderful because one of the things that we always have to look for is during, during the time of enslavement, the migration here to the Northwest, to our region, to be able to document the footprints of those pioneers that came here during the enslavement time and their contributions and how they migrated here and why they migrated here. Those are one of the things that we always want to be able to, to trace the footprints of the migration of the African-Americans that was enslaved and, and then those that were free. You know, a lot of the times we, uh, we, we began, well, I can say I began my research with my enslaved uh, ancestors. And, and where they were and, and what jobs did they have and what were they doing and where did they move and why did they move there? Those are very important questions as you do your research of, of your family and then begin to look what happened during the time of the civil war and what happened prior to it and then what happened after it because what happened prior to how they were engaged in that war, their, you know, their participation in that war, and then what happened after things began to change when they said they were finally free. Where did they stay? Where did they migrate? Where, where did they begin to, to begin to try to reconnect with family members that was sold off into slavery. And so our stories have to begin with, with us personally, how and where, you know, because the first thing you want to find out is where was your family members? Where were your people? What was going on? You know, how did we get jobs? You know, we, we begin to trace and, and reconstruct. When we talk about the era of reconstruction, we start with our reconnection and our reclaiming and then our reconciling of families that were severed during the enslavement. Because once you say you're, you know, they, they said, oh, you all are free. The first thing we did was try to find our family members that was sold off. 
And where were they sold off? Because many times our, our, the underground, we, we were following where our family members went and who they were sold to. Because we would inquire, where did they take them? Where did they go? Well, they were sold down to the plantation over here or they were sold off to down here. And well, who are, where are they now? And, and, and who bought them? And all of these things, these were the, 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 the uh, ways that we tried to stay connected with our children and our parents and, and all grandparents that was, that was sold away. You've talked to, about how Juneteenth was really an important holiday for that, like a time for people to get together and trade stories and information and help yes. track people down. Yeah. And it, I think that's a really powerful, it's like Memorial Day plus, right? It really has a, a very of personal course. quality to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You there, know, there's we, so, so much that we there's, there's so much history that we have to begin to, to, to repair and reclaim and heal. That history has to be healed and, and because we want to be healed as a people. And a lot of the things that we have to heal is ourselves because we've internalized all of the things that have been done to us as a enslaved people. And so our healing must start with ourselves and recovering and restoring of our own ancestors and ancestral practices. What I have said is the bones of my ancestors are in this soil. Where are our grave sites? Where did they lay us to rest? What happened to us? And so it's a lot of, of recovering and reclaiming of of the footprints of, of and the voices of my ancestors going out and, and want us to be able to celebrate all of the, what they what they could not. That's a huge, huge, uh, I don't know. Is it a burden? Is it a gift? Is it both? I think um, for me, I can't speak for everyone. For me, the only thing that I can say is that when my aunt and my dad passed away and I um, was there in Virginia and we were there at my auntie's house and um, we were all grieving and, and we had just come from the graveside and, and family members, we always gather and, and come together with food and, and family members with the kids running around the house. And it was then that, that I asked my aunt about the family photo album that was sitting on the fireplace. And uh, as I began to open that, the, the album, I asked her, well, who are, you know, who are these people? And the family album had had got damaged in a on the house fire that my aunt had, and she had just set it there on on the fireplace just to dry out naturally. So when I opened it up, you know, the photos were all stuck together. They, you know, I was damaging it by trying to open it up, you know, because pages were stuck together, and a lot of them were on tins. They were rusted out, you know. And so I took that photo album down to a girlfriend of mine down at the Virginia Historical Society. And I asked her, her name is Lornette Lee and she worked there as a historian and preservationist for years. And I asked her, could she please, what could she do to save uh, these photos? And so she said, I can't promise you anything, Karen, but we'll take it, we'll look at it, you know. We'll send it to you know our department where they'll try to preserve some of these old photos and things. That was in August of 2014. And then she called me right before Thanksgiving. And she said, Karen, I wasn't able to save all of them, but whatever I was able to save, I put them on a disc for you on TIFFs and, and, and I'm sending them to you in the mail and, and um, you know, 
I hope that that you'll be able to to see those things that we were able to do with what you had given us. Well, I almost dropped out of my seat when I received it. It came in the mail and I popped the disc in and she was almost able to save almost 80, three photos of my ancestors. And, and I, I, I just cried. I, I cried and 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 then I went on this hunt. I was like, well, who are they? Where did they come from? You know, so I began to um, went to the family reunion in 2015 and took all those photos there and began to ask and inquire and who's this one and who's that one and 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 the families were going, oh yeah, that's awful so and so, yeah, that's cousin so-and-so they moved here and they went there and that began my search for my own uh, family and genealogy and that began that really was the beginning that was the catalyst for the work that I do now and that really made you become a, an historian for real right like you are even in training aren't yes you, yes you graduate in June well I well, I went back. What I did was I went to UW for family history and technology certificate in 2016. I went back to school at UW so I could learn how to to search for my ancestors, you know, and it was there that I got a basic understanding of of research resources and who I needed to be Sir on them up and bro feeding in abandoned lands and you know state and county records and war pension files and you know civil war records and free African Americans in the in the north and in the south and that was really um that is when I, I had a greater understanding of where to begin to look for my ancestors. Because I didn't know, I was just, you know, I was winging it, girl. I was just trying to find them, you know, by any means possible, trying to locate the footprints of my ancestors. And so that once I went back to school at UW, I got my certificate in family history and, and uh, research. And then I went to, I, I, I enlisted at Evergreen to be able to become a cultural custodian custodian and that's what I'm in school for now. Yeah, which is an awesome term. Just I, Rita, I just wanted to check in with you. Did you have a comment or question for Karen? No. Yeah, I was going to say when you were talking about the migration north, the warmth of other suns which was a, the hot bestseller a couple years ago and I read it by Isabel Wilkerson was really really interesting. And, um, and there's another book that I bought that I haven't read yet. And it's called The Color of Money. And it's about how the federal government used uh, laws and all kinds of stuff to cheat people and rob them of what was rightfully theirs. So I'm gonna read that. But this warmth of other suns is, is really interesting to see how people migrated North. Wonderful. Reed? Yeah, I, I just wonder if uh, Akuye might be able to talk a little bit about the way that uh, having the naval shipyard and the military oh, yeah. in Bremerton really uh, yeah. changed the characteristics of our our community and and because of the um, the fact that our government did um, pretty assertively integrate our, our um, armed forces, it's uh, it's made a big difference in, in Kitsap County, I'll bet. It has. And that's why uh, back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, over 22,000 African-Americans reported to migrating here to get those jobs and to work at that shipyard, the building of the shipyard, all of that. And uh, their 
contributions to the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard, as well as the military, because the military did give them opportunities to be able to, to work employment. They offered them equal employment opportunities. So we always tried to find out, you know, when you have a people that are coming out of enslavement, where were they allowed to work to be able to be gainfully employed is so vital to the research. And you'll find they went where those jobs were. But even in the military, weren't they restricted? People of color were pretty restricted in what they were allowed to do. Oh yes, oh yes. It, it, it was very segregated as well, but the military was the first government entity that began to work on, on what I would call racial equitable practices. Somehow that seems a little ironic, but it's, you know, that's great that it started somewhere, right? Yeah, I was just going to say that, that um, it seems as though the, um, one of the things that's that's sort of lost in our country right now is a um, area where people from different backgrounds and different experiences are through dint of public service um, have an opportunity to meet and and sort of uh, in the process debunk their stereotypes. And I feel like uh, there was a period there in our armed forces where that oh, was yeah. very much the case, maybe less so today. Yes, I, I thank you for that, Reed, because one of the things that was really prominent in Kitsap County was those that that was um, working within the shipyard, working with our government, you know, Loxie Egan's, you know, um, Blacks in government um, members that was here in Kitsap County. Um, when you talk about the Larry Greens and the Mildred Passes transformed that shipyard um, during the times that they were laboring here. And so, you know, when we talk about how do we trace um, their stories, how do we preserve, you know, all, because they did some heavy lifting. Those, those were the pioneers that did heavy lifting for us um, within this region, you know, um, as far as, you know, what was happening during World War I and World War II. Um, that's why it was important that we had Henry Dick Turpin, who did tremendous exploits, but still don't don't have his Medal of Honors to be able to to honor him for the service and the lives that he saved and his contribution as undersea water inventor, all kinds of exploits that he brought to our military, as well as to our community. And he lived where? In Bremerton, Washington. Right? I know, I love that. And I love that um, Rita and I went to that program to which you were taking part in when the post office was honoring him. And we started to hear more and more of that story. And having so many what I was really struck by is how many young people of color were in the audience and you could just see the way that honoring was strengthening yeah. people who were there. You know, that's, you know, one of the things that we can do, we can strengthen all of our communities and those that are within our, our community as we begin to share. Our, our shared contributions to to our community to make our communities a place of health and well-being and our communities a place of of embitterment you know a lot of people don't know about Walter Draper oh man a tremendous gentleman that lived to be 101 years old and and passed away you know um not too long ago you know um he he made a tremendous impact in that Navy shipyard, in the city of, of Bremerton, in our county, in the public schools, you know, over. But yet, if someone asks you about Walter Draper, very few people can tell you anything about him. So what's what's one story you know, that you he about him? 
Well, you know, he was instrumental with the NAACP and the Urban League. You know, he worked with attorney Charles Stokes, you know, uh, many times with draw, uh, uh, Judge Charles Stokes to be able to transform many, many, many of the laws that was on the books during that time. And so when you, when you talk about, you know, um, contributions and, and his footprints throughout, you know, our, um, and here he was, lived right here in our county and served right here in our Bremerton and in our Navy shipyard and in our school districts, but yet his story is not, has not been preserved. That, that um, some of the things that, um, that I'm really sad about, you know, he was uh, managing and supervising public schools here in Kitsap, but you'd never be able to know he, he did anything because it's not even honored or celebrated. Sounds like some books need to get written. Yeah, I, I believe they do. Um, one of the things that I've always said is, you know, um, for the state of Washington, a lot of people don't understand that Bremerton pay, played a significant role even to those founding different things within Tacoma and Seattle communities. If you check with many of the pioneers, They'll first tell you they were in Bremerton before they moved to Seattle. They were in Bremerton before they went to Tacoma. They were in Bremerton before they went to Olympia. They were in Bremerton before they migrated out to the state of Washington. And yet Bremerton was a pretty young city. Maybe that's why, right? Because it was a boom town kind oh, of. Cool. So there were jobs. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, not even that. If you think about it, that's why I I was wondering about um, the footprints of African Americans on Bainbridge Island, because back in the day, Bainbridge was the hub. Well, and you pioneers. told me one time. I remember you saying that people had been saying, "Oh, there were no black people on Bainbridge," and you went back and looked at old right. pictures, blew them up, and you're like, "Okay, then who's that? And who's that? Who's that? Who's that? And who's that?" Who's that? And why is one of the oldest graves on in Blakely Cemetery belongs to an African American gentleman and his daughter? Why? Where? Where? I mean, if they lived and died here, what were they doing? Where did they live? What were their occupations? You know, we have to begin to ask those significant questions. And the sooner the better, right? As long, well, there's still a little connection with living memory, right? Yes. And, and it's so sad because a lot of our living memories have gone on to be with the ancestors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It seems and those are stories that we, we won't be able to recover. But that's why it's important that we, we sit down with our elders and get the living memories and legacies of what they lived through and what they endured in their lived in experience here in our county because many of them um we lost a lot of them during COVID. yeah and that you know you don't get those back and you're right that recapturing as yeah. much as possible and i always think that's a great task to for school kids to do interviews if possible because then they're the young generation coming up and, the, and it has more power when you hear those stories from a person who remembers. Akuya, we have a few more minutes. Anything you wanna make sure we carry home with us? Yes. Well, of course, you know, on the, and I believe it is Friday the 24th, we will be having our Black History Community Celebration with the soiree at the um, Bainbridge Island Museum of Arts. And then the last Sunday of the month, we will be having our community celebration at the Marvin Williams Center um, from one to four. 